we aren't encouraged to use our imagination very often, and I, I think we should be. This became real to me with my friend. We'll, we'll call her Patty. And Patty and I used to go hiking together, and she would complain about back pain. And she would tell me about the different ways that she would treat that back pain, which included going to an acupuncturist, seeing an herbalist, even some homeopathy. And by the time she went to a doctor, the tumor was so large, there was very little she could do and very little the doctors could do. And she passed away shortly thereafter. Now, we are all like Patty. We're going through our lives, trying to find the truth, and being hampered by our human limitations and our human biases. And these biases are, go by the name of confirmation bias, either or thinking, and um, correlation causation errors. And these biases are not the result of lack of knowledge. They are the result of the lack of imagination. Carl Sagan said, we wish to pursue the truth no matter where it leads. And to find the truth, we must have imagination and skepticism both. But in order to follow Carl Sagan's advice, we need a guide, a guide to proper thinking, a guide to balance the imagination and the skepticism. To find that guide, we go back 200 years to these two gentlemen, Reverend Thomas Bayes and Pierre Simon Laplace. Reverend Bayes wrote down the Guide to Proper Thinking, also known as Bayes' Theorem. Laplace independently derived it and applied it to many different fields in biology and physics and finance and sociology. And the form of this guide is the following. It says that our beliefs should scale with how well a particular explanation fits the data and how plausible that explanation is in the first place. That part of it is pretty intuitive but our beliefs should also be scaled down by the number of plausible alternative explanations for the data. And this is where imagination comes into play. So how might this work? Imagine that you have a headache and you take a homeopathic remedy and three hours later your headache is gone. How well does the explanation that the homeopathic remedy fit the data, it got rid of the headache, fits it pretty well. But we shouldn't stop there. The Guide to Proper Thinking says you should use your imagination come up with alternatives. Maybe you took something in addition to that remedy. Maybe you took an aspirin, or maybe you took a nap. Maybe the being treated by an expert is soothing enough that your headache goes away because of that. Maybe headaches go away on their own sometimes. The belief in the original explanation should be scaled down by these plausible ex alternative explanations. I'll take a totally different example. Tornado counts have increased over the past 60 years. One explanation is climate change. Temperature increase may increase the severity of storms, may increase the number of storms. But the Guide to Proper Thinking says you shouldn't stop with the, with the first explanation. You should use your imagination and come up with alternatives. Perhaps we are uh, counting more tornadoes because there are more people. Perhaps the technology is better, and we count more tornadoes that way. The Guide to Proper Thinking also suggests that we don't even stop there with the alternatives. We need to use our imagination in the next step to see which of those alternatives might actually be true. Matt Dillahunty says, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. And if we use this balance between imagination and skepticism, we can then improve our beliefs and believe more true things. This is the core of scientific thinking. It's the use of imagination and skepticism. Now, it doesn't have to always be really big topics. I think everyone should make a habit of using their imagination and skepticism. So I was working with a student. We're sitting at a table, and we're working on a project. And I looked up at the, at the wall. There was a clock there. And I noticed that the clock was broken. It was saying the wrong time, and the second hand was being erratic. I, and I pointed this out to the student, and she looked up at it and was like, no, I don't think that uh, the clock is completely broken. I mean, it's not showing the right time, but she said it's ticking out the right amount of time. It's just doing it erratically. It would take one second and then wait for three and then jump three and then wait for two seconds and jump two seconds, but it was clicking out the, the right amount of time. And I looked at it again. I was like, no, that clock is broken. 
Now we had two alternatives, and in this case I was using someone else's imagination to come up with, uh, with the alternative, and I wasn't going to stop with my own explanation, now, I had, now we had two, and I wasn't going to stop simply by listing off alternatives, we had to use our imagination to come up with a way to test it. So to make it a little bit more interesting, I pulled a dollar out of my wallet and put it down and I said, I bet you it's my explain explanation is right. So we both sat there, staring at a broken clock with our iPhones out, timing it for a couple of minutes. And I lost my dollar. It was, in fact, ticking out the right amount of time. But I was happy to lose that dollar because now I knew one more true thing and one fewer false thing. So I have a call to action for everyone. Enjoy skepticism. Look for ways to apply it. Use your imagination and come up with alternatives. Don't take the first explanation. Don't even take the second explanation. And, and when your imagination might be limited, use others. Find alternative viewpoints, find alternative people, and let them challenge your beliefs. And I believe that by applying imagination and skepticism both, you can be a better person and the world would be a better place. Thank you very much.